Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. So a quick intro before we get started. The Universal Asian is an open and safe online platform aiming to provide inspiration to Asian adoptees and hyphenated Asians around the world. We strive to mainstream discussions on any and all topics that help make our community of Asian voices universally heard. It's our goal to bring people together, so please feel free to reach out if you would like to be interviewed, or if you have something to share, or if you'd like to collaborate on a future event like this. Um, I would like to remind you all that this event is being recorded, and when you signed up through Eventbrite, you should have had the option to check a box to either give consent or not give consent to be recorded. Don't worry if you chose to remain anonymous because I will edit this later on according to that response. So if you'd like to participate, do so freely and I will fix it later on. Um, so I'm gonna be here monitoring from the back end. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to just post them in the chat, either directly to me or in the general, it's up to you. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Kyungun Lee. It's me. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for, uh... Hi, I'm I'm Kyung and Lee. Now I am sitting. Uh, now uh, it is a Sunday morning in Korea, Seoul, Korea. I am sitting in my study room in Seoul, Korea. Thank you, uh, Universal Asia, to invite me to the book talk. Uh, thank you for our participants. I'm really happy and honored to have this opportunity, and I'm. Uh, I am going to share uh, my presentation. This book, uh, we are going to talk about this book, the Global Orphan Adoption System. Uh, I know it is very academic book, but so uh, I am uh, kind of nervous when I, you know, have to introduce this academic to book to general leaders of, of, of adoptees. But nevertheless, uh, this book is about the lives, it is directly connected with the life story of, ado of adoptees. So uh, there, are, there are things that we can cover during this book talk about the essential themes of, of this book today. Um, this book was published last December. As you can see on the cover, uh, the title is Global Orphan Adoption System, and uh, we wrote orphaned in differently in shape and color in order to emphasize that the children are not rear in literal meaning orphans, but need to be recognized or certified as such for the purpose of intercultural adoption. Uh, basically, this book is about the universal story of, uh, of global intercountry adoption. More than 100 countries nowadays in the world are involved as either sending or receiving countries. And this book also puts special focus on the role of South Korea on this system's origin and development for 70 decades. Uh, this book is based on my PhD dissertation in international human rights law. Uh, why did I choose this topic? Uh, because I want to know the truth. I want to know why, why this country cannot stop it after all these economic and social progress that it is so proud of. Uh, eventually, this became the first doctorate this is in the list of Seoul National University's law school database dedicated to this topic. Then why do I publish it in English? Because I felt that without translating it, in, in, it, it into English, I, I cannot declare that this thesis is completed because uh, the most important leaders of this book will be adoptees. And I felt actually, in, uh, as a matter of fact, I felt very frustrated and regret when I have to talk about my thesis with adoptees since it was written in a language that they cannot read. But there are still many adoptees whose first language, whose first language is not English, so I hope uh, to translate this work in more other languages too. 
I do understand very well that for most adoptees, the first priority and interest lies in the personal and individual root search. Each and every adoptee has their own personal, individual, private, or even secret life story. I fully understand it and respect it. However, I have to say that in order to achieve what you want, the right to preserve and know your origin, the right to access your true identity, and the right to know where you're from, we need to bring about fundamental changes in the legal system inside South Korea. So the obstacles that adoptees are facing in the course of birth family search is not only the adoption agencies, but the much bigger problem is the national law and system of South Korea. And, uh, and I also know that some adoptees are feeling uncomfortable to, to, to deal with this issue through the lens of human rights and calling it a state violence or human rights violation committed by the state. But it is what I have found out through my research. So I have to say that, however, it is uncomfortable, but it is true. And one more thing, why I, while I have been doing so many media interviews, lectures and presentations about my research, at the end of such events, people used to ask me, so what do we do now? What is the solution that you suggest? Uh, but frankly speaking, I'm not really sure about it because we have to create a whole new solution. We cannot imitate you know, some other countries example, or we cannot pick up you know, those uh, policy measures that, that we used in the past. Uh, this is something that no country, nobody ever experienced before. So we have to create a whole new solution. Uh, all I can say is that there is no magic bullet to settle down this situation for a quick, beautiful, and desirable solution. Uh, since the problem is deep rooted, long time, and complicated, and even embedded deeply in this society, so the solution should be comprehensive, wide range, long term, and persistent, and very in detail. Uh, uh, as I said, I'm not going to deal with the overall or entire contents of this book, but uh, I will try to mention some essential themes. Uh, first is about the singularity of South Korea, about its position and impact in this inter-country adoption phenomenon of the, of the world. And the second is about the, I'm going to talk about the orphanization process. Uh, this is the word that I made up. Uh, and I define this word as the national and official procedure to recognize a child as an orphan found abandoned inside a state of origin to fit the qualification for immigration to the receiving countries. And the third theme will be about the core responsibility of the, about, of the receiving countries to fix uh, the current situation and restore the right to know their true identity of adoptees. Okay, so let's go to some bigger picture in the global level in the uh, modern era of intercountry adoption. Intercountry adoption is a flow of babies migrating, immigrating from global south to global north. It is one directional. Receiving countries only receives, sending countries only send. Uh, according to the Hague Conference of International 
private law. This is, uh, it is an international organization specialized on this issue. There are about 100 uh, countries participating in this global movement of babies. Among those 100 countries, 24 are receiving countries. They are in Northern America, uh, Western, West Europe, and Australia. And other 80 countries, eight zero, 80 countries are sending countries, the state of origin in Asia and Latin America and, and Eastern Europe and Africa. Mm. As you can see here, uh, among those you know, 100 countries who already ratified the Hague Convention, Hague Convention is the most important international legal document nowadays in the world. And uh, those, so uh, most the countries who are involved with intercountry adoption ratified this convention. As you see, the Islamic countries, they don't allow adoption system in their legal system. So they, you know, they are saying that they don't have adoption systems. So they don't have nothing to do with this hate convention. And other, you know, other than those countries, uh, most countries ratified this Hague Intercountry Adoption Convention, but there are only three countries who, uh, which just rat signed it, but not ratified it yet. Uh, and among those three countries, here's South Korea. So uh, let's go some more about the facts of South Korea and intercountry adoption. This chart, this graph was presented in 2015 at the Hale conference by Peter Selman. Peter Selman is, the, he is a renowned expert in this field. And, and he shows the, you know, uh, uh, intercountry adoption statistics of the world for a long time. And this dotted line represent the world statistics and this black line is South Korea. Uh, South Korea is so peculiar uh, in, in this uh, phenomenon. So that's why Mr. Salman choose this country. First, uh, it is outstanding about, you know, in the length of time that it continues this program uh, from the beginning until today, uh, not a single year skipped nor missing. Second, the second is the size of the number sent out from this country, uh, the number of children. It is, we estimate, experts estimate it, uh, as many as 200,000. And this is the biggest number from one country, from a single country in the world. And as you can see, it started to increase uh, in 1960s and until uh, 1980s, uh, the, the number, the graph of South Korea covers almost most or more than half of the total intercountry adoption. And when this country reduced, started reduce the number, uh, but the world statistics really soared. And uh, you may wonder what happened here. And this is the answer. Is, this is the, uh, sorry, this is the graph of South Korea. And this is the graph of China. It began its program, its intercountry adoption program in early 1990s. Uh, what is noteworthy is that when China started the intercountry adoption program, uh, their registration, they legislated the Orphan Adoption Act, uh, which is very similar to that of South Korea. It is almost like a copy and paste. So seeing you know, this phenomenon, uh, it, it can, we can easily assume that 
the system and the, the legal system and policy developed or created by South Korea was spread out to the world uh, to facilitate uh, this worldwide uh, intercultural adoption business. Now, this is the graph uh, solely about uh, South Korea from the beginning and until 2019. And uh, 1953 uh, is the year that was recorded that this country started to send out children. So next year, 2023, is most likely to be the 17th anniversary. South Korea is the longest sending country in the world history and send out biggest number of children. Even China cannot be this in terms of total number. Uh, this is the official the statistics published by Korean government and Korean government is the only country among the sending countries. I think that it is only that the number that uh, regularly and officially publishing the number that it sent out overseas for adoption. And uh, this is the official number until 2019, but we as uh, uh, experts assume, estimate that it is over 200,000 because we are witnessing so many cases that have uh, so many intercountry adoption cases that uh, are out of this official category. If so, uh, I would say that this book is not about South Korea. Uh, if somebody wants to understand the legal system, infrastructure, ideology, or social belief that made intercountry adoption possible in a country, we need to study uh, the case of South Korea. Some people want to some people want to emphasize that number has decreased in since 1990s, but it is still more than 2,000 a year, 2,000 children a year, and South Korea is still among top three as a sending country. Uh, moreover, if you see. Uh, this sorry, this in Korean, but this is the number of uh, the number of birth children, child born in this country. And so, if you see 1970s, it is like you know one million a year, and it, you know it decreased so sharply. And 19 2017, the the number born in this country a year diminished, you know, annual birth in this country is diminished as low as uh, 358,000. So it is, it diminished like, you know, just one third compared to 1970s. So, you know, this, this decrease and this decrease, uh, I'm not really sure what is the, what's the reason and what's the cause. So we cannot really say, the South Korea government really cannot say that they made any changes or, or development or progress in this uh, law and policy concerned uh, intercountry adoption. Uh, actually, South Korea now at this, uh, uh, is, um, Presently, South Korea's fertility rate is the lowest level in the world. And uh, this is, this picture, uh, I, I said earlier that South Korea does not ratify Hague Convention for Intercountry Adoption. Uh, though this picture, this picture has been taken right before the Korean, yeah, this uh, is the, uh, part of Hague Convention, the actual uh, convention document. And this is an uh, appendix of the convention and uh, with the list of the countries who signed, 
uh, this convention. And as you, as you can see, there is line for South Korea and it's been empty more than 20 years. And, and uh, this picture was taken right before the Korean health welfare minister signed this convention and it's been empty and it's been signed. Uh, it was signed in 2013, uh, May 24th. And when, you know, Korea uh, health minister visits Hague and signed it, uh, uh, he promised that it's going to ratify it. Also, South Korea is going to ratify it within five years. But after nine years, nine years have passed since the signing ceremony, but nothing happened so far. It's some, it symbolized, I think it symbolized the current situation of, of South Korea in reverse to the child protection policy and human rights protection of the most vulnerable members of the family who are women and children and alternative care of children. But the, this country's legal system cannot fulfill the international legal standard and treaty obligation. And South Koreans, they know it completely. They know it so well and completely understand what it means. However, it still, uh, there, is, there are not really, you know, still no uh, breakthrough or any momentum to make uh, fundamental changes, meaningful changes in its law and system. And this is uh, the table. Uh, this table is, is recently published by an international NGO in Geneva. And uh, it represents the list and ranking of the sending countries year by year. And by year, I want to see the year 2020. 2020 was worldwide pandemic. Uh, time, so most countries, um, they could not send out children due to the tra travel restrictions or health and safety matters. However, South Korea is the only excep exception and its number increased and it came back to ranking three, the third place in the world. So, Yes, this is um, what I prepared uh, so far is the, what I prepared to see, you know, the situation of intercultural option in global level, focusing on the situation and uh, places of South Korea. Uh, why this country? Uh, I had to reiterate that question uh, with all its economic development and cultural social changes it has achieved during the last decades cannot stop. You know, it is so exceptional in this theme, in this topic. Uh, uh, since it is global phenomenon, uh, many experts and researchers try to explain the, the factors and the causes uh, to bring about uh, intercountry adoption. A powerful, uh, two powerful, very powerful myths that sustained intercountry adoption business uh, as I would say, it's orphan myth and unwed mother myth. But I am not really, uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, this on, you know, about the unwed mother's issue because I think uh, intercountry adoption is about, you know, it's been 
more, it's been more than two decades that this whole international community agreed that intercountry adoption is not only about women's matter or the family matter. It is about the responsibility of the state of the country to protect its own children. So intercountry adoption is admitted only in case that the state of origin cannot protect its children by themselves. So when we are talking about the country cannot, you know, it is, oh, so when we are talking about intercountry adoption, we are talking about the state's responsibility. So it is not appropriate to answer to this question by raising the issues of young and vulnerable women as excuse. It is beyond individual, parental, or family matters. It is the state responsibility. We must not allow the state to hide behind the vulnerable women, making them kind of scapegoat. So I'm now I'm going to talk about that orphan myth, uh, so-called, and I also uh, earlier talked about that orphanization uh, process. Uh, making children orphan has two crucial effect in the procedure of intercountry adoption. First, it raised and make invisible the mothers, parents from the scene of adoption procedure because the children are found abandoned. And the second, it lifts or remove the burden from receiving countries to verify the adoptability of the children. Adoptability of a child is a very crucial and key point in those countries' domestic adoption procedure. If the children are not adoptable, there is no adoption court. It is impossible to adopt a child. Uh, this, it is why in countries, uh, for example, like Sweden, uh, where domestic adoption is really strictly regulated, Intercountry adoption is much easier than domestic one. So it is you know, clearly the double standard. They apply clearly the double standard. There are huge discrepancy between the, those two procedures. So make a child orphan was really, it is not just about the you know, storytelling, it is about the legal process. It was really crucial. And this chart represents how the children became orphan and adoptable for intercountry adoption. I made this chart on, based on the result, uh, result of my research, based on the law of both in receiving, of both sending and receiving countries, reports of the government and court documents of ju judicial cases of US state courts and yearbooks of adoption agencies. But later, uh, ironically, when adoptees, after I finished my thesis, when, uh, when adoptees began to share their adoption documents with me, ironically, I can verify that my theory was so accurate. Their you know, adoption files really represent this process so clearly. Uh, so I'm sure that uh, maybe adoption files collectively uh, can be the evidence of the violation of human rights by the action of the states. So I am, um, you know, this is what is happening uh, at this at this point. I'm not going, you know, details of this process, but rather I just want to I just want you to see the whole picture, and uh, please be reminded that uh, uh, you know, this blue part it is what is happening inside sending countries, and this you know this place is a uh, space is uh, about what is happening inside receiving countries, and you can see that uh, in the procedure, 
the adoption agencies inside the sending country and inside receiving country, they are key actors. And surrounding these key actors, there are uh, government bodies and they are offering assistance and they are offering necessary official documents to adoption agencies as to fulfill the needs of adoption agencies to facilitate this process. So it is almost automatically happened, just mechanically you know, processed like a lower stamp. Uh, I can see that it, it was those documents were like, you know, mass production produced by mass production system. They are all same, just the changing the names or dates, you know, some parts of the papers, but without those, some, you know, minor uh, differences, all the papers were the same. Uh, And please notify that uh, first, there are all laws, laws and regulations are involved and government bodies are involved. Family law, birth registration law, child protection law, adoption law, and the receiving countries immigration law, adoption law, naturalization process. So it was, Legalized, a legalized procedure. So please be reminded that legal does not always guarantee the justice. If the law is violating human rights, it is more dangerous than without any law or even illegality. Uh, and I just want to point out that the most important law among that so many laws involved in this process, the most important one was the immigration law of the receiving countries. And the visa, I heard from a former worker of adoption agency, Korean adoption agency, that visa was the key of this process. Without visa, the body of the babies, the body of the children cannot be transferred across the border. So I, that's why, you know, I just want to focus the role of the receiving countries. The receiving countries, uh, without the mentioning about the core responsibility of the receiving countries, it is really almost, you know, very hard to fix the current situation. And the, you know, the diverse government bodies were cooperating, like police, district office of Seoul, administrative office of Supreme Court, which is in charge of a birth registry, and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Health and Affairs, and the embassy of receiving countries. So, uh, they are all saying that the children are under the protection of adoption agency. However, uh, these agencies are not part of public welfare. They are private entities and they collect largest amount of money as fee for providing adoptive parents who are also private and private parties, specialized services to facilitate the adoption procedure. And this I saw, and I don't think that the individuals who are uh, working for this process, they are not really aware that they are cooperating in the in the process because they are all individuals as a part of the uh, uh, of those organizations, and uh, they really don't do not understand how it works as a whole. So, you know, it is the 
real problem that until now, the Korean society and the policymakers, they really don't understand this whole process that is happening among, even you know, among the global networking out of their countries. And they really have no understanding what is happening inside their countries and by the whole global networking. So, uh, that's why that we have to ask questions about, uh, sorry, about the receiving countries and about, you know, after all this orphanization process, uh, here's another uh, evidence. And uh, one of the, one of my colleagues uh, and one of the colleague, you know, he's real experts, uh, in this ish, in this topic, and he told when he saw this table, uh, he told me it is really bone chilling to realize that how a country's system can be abused or distorted to facilitate intercountry adoption for such a long period of time. And as you see, this year from 1960, uh, 1976, I started this table with from 1976, because it is the year that uh, the Supreme Court, uh, administration of Supreme Court of South Korea began to publish a judicial yearbook. And this column was selected from, I mean, uh, <clears throat> was collected from that ju judicial yearbook. Uh, and that yearbook contains uh, the total birth of the, the birth registry of the year that was reported as found abandoned. And this column, so this found abandoned number is uh, represent, you know, this process. When adoption agents reported uh, administration office that this baby is found abandoned, they almost automatically and mechanically uh, issued and provide orphan hojok for the children to this adoption agency. And this number represent that process. And this adopted overseas, this column was collected from uh, the report of four adoption agencies who are uh, which are allowed to do adoption business in South Korea. And as you can see, those two numbers are so strikingly similar. So what does this mean? Uh, after, you know, I collected and compared these two numbers of each year. And I cannot just ask this question. Uh, are those children adopted for better protection or are those children made orphaned to be adopted? And uh, this is my you know, final uh, chart uh, for the presentation. And I made it, I composed it in order to ask, in order to think about the responsibility or core responsibility of the receiving countries. Uh, you may know about uh, the recent development going on in Europe in regards to official investigation about the past illegal adoption cases. I think it is the right direction to go, uh, but I'm still uh, dubious or um, kind of skeptical about how far they are going, how far they would go and how precise uh, and how trustable those investigations are going to be. And I am arguing that these days that in order to any you know, uh, any investigation in order to be effective, 
uh, in it should be done through the cooperation with sending countries. And this chart represents uh, the main receiving countries from South Korea, United States, France, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Netherlands, Belgium, Australia, Canada, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, and even Luxembourg. Such a small country, you know, and <clears throat> these are number of children adopted. And you can see that Denmark is such a small, it is really a small country, but uh, in uh, regards to the numbers of children uh, adopted, they are like, you know, even Sweden, Denmark, Norway, they are kind of big. And United States is uh, like three quarters, three quarters of children uh, or when they went to the United States. And uh, some countries, they stopped uh, adoption from South Korea. And these are affiliated Korean agencies with those countries. All four adoption agencies are connected with, uh, United, with the uh, agencies in the United States. But as you see, in, in the other countries, there are only one, you know, adoption agencies connected to this intercountry adoption business. Uh, these four court, SWS, Social Welfare Service, Eastern and KSS, Korean Sur Social Service, these four adoption agencies, uh, they are established or those four agencies are established in 1950s and 60s. Uh, and the Korean government intentionally keeps these agencies in small numbers. Uh, without the government's license, uh, it is illegal to the intercountry adoption business uh, in South Korea. So, those four agencies received monopolized business permission from the government. Uh, and each and every agency, they have uh, their own business networking or MOUs uh, with agencies in receiving countries. Uh, and as you can see, those agencies divide uh, the region for their uh, business area. And uh, now there's only three agencies uh, currently doing uh, intercountry adoption business and KSS, they stopped uh, this, uh, stopped it in 2012 or 14. Uh, 12 or 13, uh, but they continue to provide the post adoption service for birth family search. So, uh, I want you to understand that whether a child is adopted domestically or over or internationally, to which country this child is going to be adopted how many children are going to be sent to uh, which country? All those tremendously important decisions have been made by private adoption agencies without any intervention or assessment, assessment by public uh, authorities. So, uh, Adoption agencies have their own inner rules and principles to make such decision. I don't know what they are. I don't think any you know, experts or government bodies in this country, even now, presently know about their the rules or procedures. Uh, to make such decisions. And I don't think that these 
standards are the best interest of the child. So, and uh, this is it uh, that I prepared for today's presentation or book talk uh, presentation. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm just raising questions and I try to provide some answers, but uh, I am not, I cannot really provide the very clear and uh, answers for all those questions that I myself raised. I'm on the way, I'm, I think I'm, I'm, I'm on the way uh, to find the answers or uh, there should be, you know, another uh, actors that should provide those answers. <clears throat> And uh, those responsibilities, I think, I'm sure that should go to the government bodies, public authorities, competent authorities of sending and receiving countries. So, <clears throat> yes, uh, and this is it. So I'm going to, Ella, are you going to open the floor for any questions? Yes, yes, I am. If anybody has any questions, now is the time to speak up. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, so don't hesitate. Hi, my name is Jennifer Strong, and I am uh, uh, I was adopted in 1971 as an infant, and I just wanted to thank you very much uh, for your research. And I was, I was curious how uh, when you when you talk about this and you present this in in Korea, what are how do people react in in South Korea to all of this? Okay, react. Uh, you know, it is not a secret inside South Korea. So basically, they know, uh, they know. But you know, all those media and but it is as the law and policy are distorted, and so. Uh, the I we cannot expect that social you, you know uh, social awareness or social belief or the media report is very uh, can be very clear or uh, delivering uh, the right messages. So uh, the reaction first. Uh, it is very calm uh, when you face uncomfortable truth. Uh, the our natural reaction is to avoid uh, your face. You know, just uh, refuse to see it directly, or just you know facing it. Uh, they, I yes, I, it is true that I drew some uh, intention, uh, some attentions. When I published uh, this thesis, I uh, some media attentions and some, you know, uh, I made a presentation in academia and media, but uh, the attention was not big enough to make any meaningful changes in law and system. So that's why, you know, from 2020, I started to speaking in English, pre make a presentation in English and uh, writing, uh, publishing the, this book in English because I felt that the right holders themselves, I mean, the doctors or uh, relevant researchers or the uh, competent authorities of receiving country, they have to know about it uh, without that co-responsibility relations uh, we really cannot reach anywhere. Um, so I hope it, it answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Hey. Lee. Hi. <laughs> Thank you very much for your research and uh, for writing this book. Um, what, what do you kind of think uh, of the future of um, the receiving countries, uh, do you see any movement in their legal, like turning towards legal um, solutions to uh, 
the international adoption, the intercountry adoption procedures. Um, the Netherlands has stopped intercountry adoption. Um, why is that, and how how do you think that um, receiving countries can their policies can be changed? Uh... Uh, you know, uh, I actually try to talk with the uh, receiving countries authorities uh, uh, since last year, but uh, I'm not very hopeful, but uh, anyway, nonetheless, I think we have to continue the efforts to giving them the messages, the right messages. And for example, uh, you know, uh, I talked with the with the embassy people here, uh, Netherlands or Sweden, but and the conversation itself was good, but uh, there was no further, you know, meaningful measures to continue. Uh, this corporation, and but I'm still talking uh, to those people that uh, you know the countries of the uh, especially the receiving countries in Europe, the Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, France, and and all those countries they are very proud of uh, the human rights situation and. Uh, they are saying that their foreign policy uh, purpose is promoting human rights in other countries. So those embassy people are really concerned about the human rights situation in South Korea, such as the death penalty situation, LGBTI rights situation. But then I am asking them uh, thank you so much for having concerns about the human rights situation in South Korea. But what about your own citizens' human rights? Because adoptees are all the citizens of those countries. So please, please do take care about the human rights of, of your own citizens. It is you know, the right to know their origin, the right to know their true identity. This is really important and basic human rights entitled in or so many UN human rights conventions. So uh, this is the thing that I am uh, delivering to those countries. So we'll see, we'll see if we can make any impact. Thank you. Um, I actually have a question if anybody else doesn't. Um, so I know that um, a lot of adoptees lose their birth country citizenship when they're adopted. And I was wondering if you think that it should be the duty of the sending country to restore citizenship to their adoptees, if that's something that could be seen as taking responsibility for allowing adoption to have happened in the first place. Personally, like I don't, I'm, I'm a Chinese adoptee, so I don't think China anytime soon is going to be allowing any kind of citizenship restoration or dual citizenship at all. But in a perfect world, do you think that should be the sending country's responsibility? Yeah, and yes, I think that uh, first of all, and most of all, the sending country's government should not abolish the citizenship of its own national when they were under age. You know, according to international human rights norms, no, you know, that about the citizenship, the changes of citizenship and nationality of a person and of a child, it should not be touched. Because the, the role of the nationality, the citizenship is the protection, is 
that person's right and it is the, the purpose is to protect of that person, the human rights of that person. So they should not, the, the authorities, they should not abolish a citizenship or nationality of a child under age. If the, you know, uh, it, in many cases, the nationality act of a certain country does not allow your citizenship. Yes, I do understand, but at least, they can wait until they get to the age uh, so that they can make their own decisions, whether to preserve this nationality or to choose another. So that is not, you know, uh, for the first time, the, uh, it should not be allowed that the sending country's authority uh, unilaterally abolish the nationality of a child adopted abroad. So that is principle, but you know, <laughs> the word does not move according to the principle and standards. And the second point is that whether the sending country should restore the nationality of an adoptee, actually, you know, that is, that is what is doing, the Korean government is doing, uh, that is what the Korean government is doing currently they restore the nationality of, they allow the restore of nationality of adoptees and allow the dual citizenship very exceptionally. However, the dual citizenship means that you only exercise your uh, Korean nationality inside South Korea, and you don't exercise your other nationality inside South Korea, which means that you only speak English, and you only speak, you know, and you have no idea, you connection or personal relation, relatives inside South Korea, what does, you know, a nationality, what, what's, for, what's of the use? Is it useful? Is it meaningful? Oh. It's kind of, yeah. So it can be very symbolic. So I do agree, but Symbolic and practical, there are two different things. So we have to, you know, it is not just to, to, to uh, as I said, that just restoring the nationality is not a magic bullet. But yes, I do know it is very important. Uh, it is very important. I do not uh, deny it, but uh, they should, we should do more than that. We should do more than just restoring the nationality of adoptees. So it is the role of the government. So how committed the government is to protect the rights of the adoptees, uh, it should go beyond just restoring the nationality. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that is pretty much our time. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, this was actually really, really amazing and I learned so much. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. It means a lot. Yeah, I hope to see you again. All right, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. <laughs>